Thank you, Rob. It's always scary when you have Rob introducing. You never know where he's going to go, but he did a good job, and uh, I uh, definitely appreciate that. Um, we were driving over here, and he said, uh, hey, boss, are you nervous about this? And I said, well, absolutely. And he said, but you're just giving your testimony. And I said, you obviously don't know my testimony. <laughs> so after this is over with, uh, the things may change a little bit. But no, it's, it's definitely an honor to be here and uh, learning about toolbox ministry and the impact on lives. And what I really want to kind of navigate through today is some of what Rob said, but maybe I'd do a little bit deeper dive on my journey uh, with a little creamery. It's good to be here, obviously, from Brenham. When I left, the cows were happy. Uh, I apologize that we don't have ice cream on the table. Uh, it started to melt. Yeah, it started to melt, and I had no other option but to start eating. And so uh, for that, I apologize. Uh, but next time, if I ever get the invitation back, we'll figure a, a way to make that work. Uh, my life obviously started young, like most of us, and uh, grew up in a family uh, of really a mother and a father that not just uh, talked about Jesus, but they lived Jesus. They talked about a relationship of what that meant um, to not just check a box or to um, go to church on Sunday and feel good, but to take what you would get on Sunday and be able to go through the week and through the months and really learn how to apply it to your life. And, and they both really insisted that there are going to be highs and there are going to be lows. It's guaranteed. Our, in fact, we, we heard that earlier today as far as the desert. If, you're, if you live long enough, you're going to have both. And so that preparation and that foundation at a young age um, has just been phenomenal because that really did set the stage for my life. I... Um, had a girlfriend in high school, and uh, we dated for probably two years. Well, we did date for two years, and then I left to go to a little college actually in Abilene, McMurray College. And the reason that is is she wanted to go to Baylor, but she was a year behind me. And I ran track, and I thought, well, I'm not fast enough for the Southwest Conference, so I'll go to McMurray for one year, and then as soon as she graduates from high school, I'll chase her to Baylor. Uh, at that point in time in my life, I did not have what I would say was the path. I didn't really know at that point what God had in store for me. I thought it po possibly could be law. Uh, I'm glad that uh, that didn't work out because I would not have been a very good attorney. Skip, I know that that comes as a surprise, but hopefully you can <laughs> accept that. Um, but um, Beta was a great school, and she was a sweetheart. We got there, and within the first week at Baylor, we broke up. <laughs> God works in mysterious ways. There's no question. But there was a purpose behind that, but because it got me to Baylor. And at Baylor, uh, the beginning of my junior year, I was given the assignment to follow a company in a consumer relation class on how they relate to the consumers. And so we had a semester to, to do this project, and at the end of the semester, we had to turn in about a 25-page type report on, in, on our findings. I went back to my apartment and did what any college student would do. You'd call your dad and say, okay, dad, I need help and I need it fast. I've got to find a company. And he happened to be reading an article on this little creamery in Brenham, Texas. And he said, I don't know if this means anything, but let me start at the top and just read it to you. And so he read me the article and I thought, who could not want to use ice cream <laughs> as a report for a semester? And so. I called down to, to Bluebell and I um, talked to a gentleman by the name of John Barnhill, who was executive vice president, and he said, sure, come on down. I'd be more than happy to help you with this journey. Came back to, to Waco, wrote the paper, got to about page 21, 22, and it needed to be 25 pages long. And so I thought, man, I'm in trouble. I don't have time to go back to Burnham to get more information. This is back, and for some of you, this thing called a typewriter. Uh, <laughs> it uh, wasn't able to uh, cut and paste. I had to pick up with the end of the story of where I was, try to take the plane back up and go around a couple of more times before I could land it. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm kind of stuck. And then it hit me. There was, a, there was a gentleman by the name of Paul Cruzy who was uh, actually 
president of Bluebell, uh, Ed Cruz's son, who was in Baylor Law School. And so I looked him up in the phone book. I called and I said, I'm, I'm in a bind. Uh, would you mind if I come over and ask you some questions about your parents' company? And that's how Paul Cruzy and I met each other for the first time. Now, he will tell you he's the one that not only got me across the finish line with that paper, but got my grade. Uh, I will not uh, admit that, but it was sure glad that he, you know, Paul was there. There's no question. It came time f um, for graduation, and still, I was a marketing journalism major. Uh, journalism only because there were some accounting classes that I did not want to take. And that just seemed like a natural thing to do. I love to write. And so uh, I still didn't know what God had in store. But I knew that he did have something for me. And so in the process of going through interviews and looking at public relation firms and looking at advertising firms, I thought about that little creamery back in Brenham, Texas. So I called and went back down and interviewed uh, for a position. I really honestly didn't know what I'd be interviewing for. I thought, you know, do you get to pick out your truck? Do you uh, get to pick out your own music, your subdivision to drive through? No, I'm kidding. Uh, it, you know, but what I had learned in that time of writing that paper, that Bluebell was a company that uh, was not just focused on the bottom line, wasn't just focused on um, getting to, to grow as fast as it possibly could, that it was a cinch by the inch, and we were gonna go at a, grow at a, a pace that we could handle, and um, saying that, even though, as Rob said, we were 115 years old, it was about 1960 when we came into Houston. And from 1960 to 1980, we expanded. I mean, we went all the way to Austin, went up to Dallas, <laughs> and that was pretty much the whole uh, gamut of it. But during that time, every four years, our sales doubled. And so things were really starting to, to take um, traction. And I thought, um, this is the kind of place I think that I can not just go to and work, but it would, is a place that I could call a home and a career. And so uh, I accepted the position and uh, went to, to work for Bluebell up in Dallas. Between 1981 and 1984, I worked in that market. We, when I started in 1981 up in that market, we had what we call a direct store delivery system where our trucks actually take the product to the store and actually uh, merchandise the uh, product in the uh, ice cream section. Uh, others send it to a warehouse uh, where they lose contact of it. And we just truly believe that ice cream is sensitive enough that it needs that final attention uh, into the case. At that time, we had 16 routes in the Dallas market. And within three years, we went from 16 routes to 60. As you can see, it was, it was happening, and it was happening in a fun way. Uh, I was glad I was single. <laughs> it would have been tough because we worked long hours, but um, things were definitely happening. And when I say I was single, I, uh, not long into that, I did um, get married and started a family. I was asked in 1984 to go to San Antonio, which is where I was from, and start our, our branch operation in San Antonio. And I got to be honest with you, I thought I'd hit, you know, this is it. Um, I was living large. I was 24 years old and was probably way too green to be given the responsibility, but Skip, you didn't hear that either, okay? Skip's on our board, by the way, so he's recording this and taking it, no, I'm kidding. But uh, in that journey to San Antonio, we started that market, and for the next five years, uh, was able to, to, again, start a family and, and to, to see just life was, couldn't have been better. In 1988, the middle of 88, I was asked to move to Oklahoma City and start our first out-of-state branch. And in 1989, we opened not only Oklahoma City, but we opened up our uh, ba um, Baton Rouge branch. I'm trying to remember. Thank you, Rob. That's why I brought Rob. If I get in trouble, I know I can look and get the answer. That journey uh, was also included in it that as we grow uh, the um, the enticement also as we may start a new region, and if so, that you would be the man that would fit that gap. Now again, still 29 years old at that point, uh, things were moving at a very fast pace, but at the same time, um, it couldn't have been more exciting. I get the phone call uh, from John Barnhill again, and he says, uh, we're, we're gonna have this quarterly sales meeting, and after the meeting's over with, we'd like to spend a little time with you. And so I'm thinking, well, this, this must be it. You know, the, the, the promotion may be on the way and I'll be moving in this position. Well, that was just the opposite of what took place. And I share this to you because I think it's real important that to walk with God as he leads you. 
And so often what we try to do is we try to help him. And we try to get ahead of him. And when you get ahead of him, God has such an unbelievable way to pull you back in. And that's what that meeting was all about. It was about a page and a half of notes of things that I had either stopped doing or needed to do. But my attention to what was important was not where it should have been. I talk about that evaluation to this day, obviously, in, the, in, in when I speak, because it really truly showed me that it's not about Ricky Dixon. It's about what God wants. And when we go to work, I love Colossians 3.23. It says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. And when I read that, actually, when I got back to my, my hotel room, that was what jumped out at me. And um, one of my life verses that at the time and still to this day was Psalms 91.1, which says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And I truly believe what had happened was unintentionally, complacently, whatever the word might be, I had drifted out from underneath that. And it was God's way of pulling me back in at that point in time in my life. I kept that evaluation with me for many, many years. And whenever I would travel, I had it in my briefcase. If I came across it, I'd pull it out and reread it just to, to keep me grounded and to keep, keep me um, where I needed to be. Because it wasn't about Ricky Dixon. It was about doing what God had for myself. From there, we moved to Tulsa. We were opening up not just a branch in Tulsa, but also a manufacturing plant. And from there, moved to Kansas City and then back to Tulsa. I know, it was a lot of moves. A lot of people thought I had U-Haul um, stock. Am I doing okay? Okay, good. Can you, everybody hear me? Okay, good. But it was during that time that um, I discovered that the vows that hold a marriage together had been violated. And that probably rocked me more than anything has ever rocked me in my life. I didn't believe in divorce. There was enough scripture there that I had grounds to, to make the move. But that's not what God was saying. He kept, he kept telling me to stick in the fight, stick in the fight. So for the next three years, three and a half years, worked as hard as we could to make the marriage work. But unfortunately, it became evident that the issues were too deep and the marriage ended up failing. It was during that time, um, like I say, it's probably the lowest point. There was a lot of questions that I had. There was um, a point where I knew that I was at a crossroad. I could either become bitter and angry or I could gravitate to my Savior. And fortunately, because of the background that I had and the foundation that I had, I chose to gravitate towards my Savior. I probably read this passage I'm getting ready to read more and more through that whole course of time. And it's, it's when Jesus is been preaching out of a boat back towards the shore and he's had a long day and he turns and he says as the evening came this is mark 4 31 uh, 35 through 41 as evening came jesus said to his disciples let's cross to the other side of the lake so they took jesus in the boat and started out leaving the crowds behind although other boats followed but soon a fierce storm came up high winds were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Now, how in the world do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> but he's the master. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? And when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Be silent. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. He then asked them, Why are you so afraid? Do you still not have, do you not have any faith? The disciples were um, absolutely terrified and said, Who is this man? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Obey him. That's the Christ that I know. That even in the strongest of waves and the strongest of wind, I could either panic or I could go to sleep next to my Savior. And that's what I chose. I'd wake up during the night. I would go right back to that verse. And I, I would think, He's still sleeping. I'm going to go back to sleeping. I remember uh, in conversations with God, there was a lot of them. If, if you drove down the road and saw me 
in my car by myself and in the animation of a conversation, it was me talking to God. And uh, we had some great conversations, let me tell you. But um, what's so amazing about that story is even the disciples at that point didn't really understand. Not only will you rest with Jesus, you can rest in Jesus. And that is so powerful, and that's what sustained me through that. I had three children. I was now single. I was trying to run an ice cream plant. At that time, I was calling on our uh, number one customer, which happens to be in Bentonville, Arkansas. Well, I've got to figure that one out. But at the same time, I was anchored to a rock, and even though I didn't understand, and there's a lot of questions to this day, I trust him. I trust him. It wasn't long after that I got the phone call to come to Brenham. Now, I had been a lot of places, but I'd never lived in a little town of Brenham, Texas. I'd been there many times, but um, I told my, uh, at that point, I skipped over and I shouldn't have. The most important part is a few years later, I was um, introduced to uh, what is now my bride. And um, she's definitely my rock along with Christ. Um, I got very, very lucky uh, while, how God brought us together. Um, she, will, she has a lot of the same interest, and although she says she does. She'll hunt with me. She'll even help field dress a deer if you promise her a shopping spree at a mall. <laughs> uh, but God definitely blessed me and put it, what I tell people. I was on the potter's wheel, and God at one point in time, had me designed as a plate, and I got thrown off the potter's wheel, and he picked the clay back up. And what I think he did is he turned me into a bowl, which is probably a lot more applicable for what I do. And so you have to trust in God no matter when it doesn't understand and allow him to mold you in the way he wants you to be. So we moved to Brenham, and um, between 2000, I, I moved in 03, she moved in 05, mainly because we had one uh, of our youngest was still in high school. We waited till he graduated. But since that point, from 2005 to 2017, I served in the capacity of both general sales manager and vice president of sales. I was, I was back on what I want to call my bike. You know how there's certain things in life you do that just come natural. Well, talking in sales and believing in a product was what came natural. Running an ice cream plant uh, was outside of the, um, it wasn't on the, the, the resume or the questionnaire when I filled it out, but uh, probably the greatest challenge. Because when you're running an ice cream plant and your peers are expecting the very best, you do not want to let them down. And so from 2005 until, like I say, 2017, I served in that capacity. In that period of time, things were happening with Bluebell. We were growing at a very rapid pace. We were going into brand new markets. Our market share was going up, um, and then 2015 happened. And hopefully I don't have to explain what that means. <laughs> Y'all are from this area. So uh, that episode in 2015, and, and really the seven years now plus later, is really what helped Bluebell go from really the innocent company that's out in the country to buckling down, focusing back on what God has in store, trusting him, stay humble, but yet confident in what we do. And so that's exactly the way we approached it. We didn't get caught up in all the things that were being said. We knew that we needed to change. We knew that we needed to get outside the little town of Brenham, maybe mindset. And I'm so happy today to tell you that the changes that we've made, I couldn't be more proud of. Comes 2017, and I was asked to be named president of Bluebell. It was a shock. There's no question. Uh, people ask me, what did it feel like when you were asked to become president of Bluebell? And immediately, and since then, I think of the Bubba Watson quote when he was asked, how does it feel when you won, won the Masters? And he said, I, I never got this far in my dreams. <laughs> and uh, when you have a legacy of the Cruzy family that started back in 1919, it's just not something that you think about. But I'll also say, during what happened in 15 and what happened prior to that, kept me in, in tune with what God was doing in whatever capacity he wanted me to do. And that's to include running an ice cream plant. When things were happening in the, on the sales side and to be asked to come over to the production side, um, that took faith, but it took faith on both parts, uh, the company and, and also myself. I never will forget the, the time I walked. It was soon after I was named president. I'm going to walk the floor and I'm going to interject with people and get to know people. And that's 
One of the things I absolutely love to do, I, I like to be a part of it because I look at uh, what we do as a team. And I never will forget that first day uh, as I'm walking through, I had a packager who was sleeving ice cream and I got one of those head nods. <laughs> so I don't know who they are. I don't know who she is, but I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go over and we'll see. So I walk over and she says, um, are you a cruisy? And I said, no, ma'am, I'm, I'm not. And she looked right at me and she said, well, then how did you get it? <laughs> you talking about being humbled right then. All I could think of is I told her that I had put in for adoption papers and I was waiting for the Cruzy family to accept me into the family. Uh, but it was really at that point in time, not just that with her, but at that, that, that moment in my career that I realized that everything looking back that had happened in my life was God's way of preparing me for this moment and for my future that now lies ahead. And there hadn't been a day that hasn't gone by. The first thing that I do when I get up is I get on my knees and I pray for guidance because this responsibility is unlike anything I've ever had. And uh, the family in which I've talked about, that family of which we've gone through, it's been quite, quite the journey. I liked the Bubba Watson quote, but I really liked the quote that I heard last week. I don't know if you all watched Serena Williams' final match. And they were interviewing Serena, and then afterwards they interviewed Isla Tomlianovic. How'd I do? That was, that was a fun one. Got it? Yeah, we practiced that one. <laughs> Isla made the comment when asked about Serena. What does she mean to you, and what's your opinion? And she said, Serena embodies that no dream is too big and that no matter where you come from or what your circumstances, you can do anything if you believe in yourself. And I thought that's the kind of quote that I want to land on. I would tag on that you not only believe in yourself, but that you believe in where God has taken you to have that passion. Uh, we talk a lot about passion and, and being in the ice cream business and, and uh, making the different flavors. I'm, I'm thinking there's flavors that we made before that we're not making right now that I've had a few come up, and I'm sorry, Rob's fault, uh, for sure. Uh, but um, <laughs> the uh, passion that goes behind it is, is um, it's incredible to read the letters. There's so many letters that come, it's as if they, we made that particular flavor specifically for them and the impact that that flavor has in their life. It also is a, a product that no matter what kind of day you've had, whether it be a good day or a bad day, it's a reward. And so from that standpoint, um, it, it really has been easy to have that passion. I will say this. One of my favorite authors is the preacher Mark Batterson. I don't know if he may or may not know the name. You see some do. He's a pastor up in Washington, D.C., and we've become good friends. But he has a book called If, and one of my favorite quotes comes from that book. And it says, at some point, most of us stop living out of our imagination and start living out of our memory. That's the day we stop creating the future and start repeating the past. That's the day we stop living by faith and start living by logic. That's the day we stop dreaming of what if possibilities and end up with if only regrets. You see, we start dying the day we stop dreaming. And ironically, we start living the day we discover a dream worth dying for. Amen. And I tell you, when you can capture that in your walk and know that no matter what the dream is, it's going to be hard. And the bigger the dream, I will say, is the longer the journey. But I also try to look at our lives or my life is you have the mountaintops and you have the valleys. Both are guaranteed. But we spend most of our time going up or coming down. And it's what we do in that time that prepares us for both. I uh, can't help but think when things don't make sense, I go to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. That's how I've tried to live my life. I have um, been blessed beyond measure the fact that I had the opportunity to come to work for this whole company, uh, not far from where I grew up. I've been blessed uh, to, even though I went through the trials of the first marriage, the second, we celebrate 25 years next February. Five children between us, 
eight grandchildren that definitely have our hearts. We like the kids, but we love the grandkids. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I don't know really honestly what will be next until God tells me to get off the Bluebell boat. I will keep giving it everything that I have. But when the day comes, I will promise you that he's already got a vision. He's already got a dream for me. And I can't wait to see how that opens up. And until I take my last breath, I want to be serving my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's an honor to be here. And um, thank you so much for your time. Well, we are going to take a few moments. Uh, Ricky, that was excellent. In fact, as you describe some of the moments you've gone through and the things you've encountered, it reminds me just of if one of the great truths uh, from the Bible is if for a person who's a follower of Christ, it says you've been born again to a living hope. And to hear that there's a, a hope that goes through those uh, valleys that are just about as tough as anything anybody could hit. And, uh, but that there is that, that strength and that hope that goes in that place that, that really brings about transformation and, and uh, new life and direction. Uh, we did want to just take an opportunity, if anybody has a question or two, um, for Ricky, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, take an opportunity for that yeah, right here. So what's your favorite flavor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love a softball to start with. Thank you. Uh, I usually say whatever we're making, <laughs> but uh, outside of homemade vanilla, which has got to be up there at the top, uh, it kind of shifts. Um, the, that strawberry lemonade that we had this summer, uh, I kind of jumped up there. Uh, we have another one that'll be out tomorrow that I guess we cannot. Yep, I'm getting a t- I'm not, uh, <laughs> Come on, won't tell, but uh, uh, <laughs> see, Rob. <laughs> but anyway, um, there's very, very few flavors that just really don't hit. Um, and I do like to rotate it around uh, just to, to keep in the game. But great question. Right here. Uh, <laughs> Rob, <laughs> you're not answering that. We do have a no sugar added um, uh, vanilla that uh, is definitely, and it's something that we're looking at. Uh, you know, when we came back in 15, and I say this in all sincerity, uh, we had to redo everything. I mean, we took everything out of the plants. We took the floor up. We took the walls down. We took the ceiling and really literally rebuilt in a rapid, rapid pace. And we brought in microbiologists that introduced us to so many different things that uh, may have gone well beyond what we needed to do. But in the process, uh, uh, we had one of our plants, or what we call a snack plant, which was the original plant, uh, make a lot of our take-home snacks. And so with, the, with, with that not being available and the limitation of the changes, we've had to focus just really on the ice cream and the pints, and we're getting back in the take-home snack, you know, the moo bars and the fudge bars and those kind of things. But really the journey back has been, um, I'm happy to say that, you know, this year we should be hitting about the same numbers that we did uh, in 15, and next year um, we're even beyond that. So, yeah. Back for it. Real. Challenges, yes, yes. Challenges as a vice president of sales and how I leaned on my faith. Um, there's no question. I think the thing that I learned early on is the, the uh, support from the company to believe in what we, the, what we do and the way we do it. And so when you do make a, you know, a sales call on a Walmart or a Kroger, uh, and I hope no one, is anybody in here from any of those organizations? I love you. I love you. <laughs> but uh, you just have to, you have to stay true to that. Uh, we've, we've never paid slotting to go into a store. Um, there, there's some things that it's not that they're wrong. They're just not something that were part of our equation that we get uh, asked quite a bit and pressured quite a bit. And um, we just stay true to it. And, and really consumer, you know, the demand and consumer response helps that continue. But um, uh, new markets, hiring, as everybody is going through right now, we're, we're you know, from the labor pool, uh, getting people not only to come to work or get hired, but to come to work. Uh, it's a different day today than it was even 10 years ago. So definite new challenges that we haven't had before. But hopefully that answered uh, your question. Yeah, right here. Yes. I had a pleasant surprise as I was riding my moped in Bermuda. We walked into a 
grocery store for a little bit of refreshment, and there was Bluebell ice cream. Wow. <laughs> wow. That uh, makes me even feel worse that I couldn't even bring it from Brenham to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a great endorsement for Bermuda. And uh, if you haven't done your travel plans for this year, you can get Blue Belt. No, that's great to hear. That's great to hear. Right. Rick. My father grew up, uh, worked for Kimberly Clark as well. He touched on slotting, shell space, or whatever. We see craft ice creams now. There's so many diverse products out there. How do you stay relevant? What are some of the other things that you're doing? Because it's always product placement. That's right. It's, uh, pressure to plot, pay for that shelf space. Can you expand on craft ice cream, staying relevant? Yeah, I think it's a great question to stay relevant when you have uh, the market continually changing in craft. Uh, we, we had Briars and Dryers and haagen and Ben & Jerry's. You have a lot of those brands that have been, been there for many years and kind of shift. Uh, if you and you're if you're in the store and you're shopping, you can just look at the shelf space and a lot of times we end up with what's left. And I don't mean that in a bad way. There's some great stores. In Houston, Texas, we have good presence. But there's a lot of markets where we may have 30 or 35 flavors and only have a half a door or a door product. And so it makes it extremely difficult to, to, to be able to break through. So um, advertising in itself, even though I talked about how much I loved it back in the late 70s, early 80s, it's changed dramatically. Digital and Facebook and Instagram and you know, I told Rob we were going to advertise on Snapchat, but it kept disappearing. But I, I, I <laughs> sorry, Rob. Hey, I'm here all day just in case you need me. <laughs> but I think uh, we've got to pay attention to that and, and uh, use different methods. But it really comes down to consumer demand. Uh, in Texas, we're a little over 50, 52 percent market share but we have nowhere near the 50% market uh, space in the, in the stores. But because we're direct store delivery, we kind of offset that to where, um, it's, it, you know, when ca cost of diesel keeps going up, you want to make sure that it's, we're being treated fair. But it's a great question. Yeah, it's real good. Good. Ricky, could you talk about how you all come about different flavors and how you go about naming them? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going there, didn't you, man? <laughs> Well, uh, we, we have it where uh, employees or people put the right in, will give us suggestions, and then we try to t turn that all over to R&D. They try to come up with about 15 different concepts and or ideas about the fall, about right now, and we're looking at next year or the year after. And so once you find five or six that we really feel like, okay, this is going to be our lineup, then not only we do, do we turn it over to R&D, but we turn it over to quality assurance and quality control when we analyze what ingredients go into it and how um, on a scale of a real low risk to real high risk, there's some ingredients that are just very high risk that we um, don't, want to, don't want to take the chance on. So uh, we will, once we get that narrowed down and we, okay, these are the flavors, then it goes into the naming of, of the flavor. And, and the question I think was, um, okay, we had a flavor come out and it was called uh, cookie, to the, cookie um, squared, cookie to the second power. It was cookies and cream and chocolate chip cookie dough. And we were sitting around thinking, we gotta, is this the name we're really ready to go with? We're getting ready to print the cartons and send the product out. And it just didn't make sense to me. If it's cookie squared, it should be like twice as much uh, or the Oreo cookie or the cookie that's in it. So I sent everybody home on that Friday and I said, everybody go home and I don't care who you ask, ask your neighbors, ask your kids, ask the dog, and any name you can come up with that basically the flavor was called Blue Monster in our parlor and it had a blue dye. And the dye would make your mouth blue and the kids loved it. Well, what we noticed that it was really doing well and we thought, well, putting the blue dye in a flavor really probably isn't gonna go over very well in, in mom's home. So in it, a parlor, it's fine. So that's the concept that so we're driving into Houston, my wife and I and, and two others, and we're sitting there. We actually had been a wreck out on 290, and so we're just at a standstill. And I said, okay, let's just start naming, coming up with names, and just start throwing them out. <laughs> and so we're writing them down. And it was my wife <laughs> who said, what about Texas Two-Step? I said, well, that sounds good in Texas, but I don't know how that'll play out in Florida. And then she said, well, why don't you go with Cookie Two-Step? And I thought, you know, that's pretty good. Now, here's the problem. It's my wife. <laughs> so I uh, said, let's do this. Let's just submit it and not say where it came from and just let the marketing department take it from there. But they ended up landing on that. And uh, 
She reminds me of her, her con contribution to uh, the success of that. It's a top five flavor for sure. Awesome. All right, Charles, right there. So many guys here leave businesses, uh, so many in the public sector, others private. Talk to me about the challenge that we have in our culture today that's so hard against Christ's teaching in many yeah. ways. What are three principles wow. that we can carry back into the marketplace to help turn some heads towards Christ? Whoa, look at that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no. No, it's a, it's, it's a, I appreciate the question. I really do. And I may not pop three answers quickly to you. Yes, well, amen. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be. I think that um, we do talk about it a lot. Um, the big thing coming around the corner, and I'm sure I've heard about ESG and, and the impact that's going to have on companies, and the E is for environment, the S is for social uh, activity or social involvement, and then governance on the back end. I, I think that at times like this, and where I sit and land, I'm going, to, I'm going to continue to put my faith in Christ. I'm going to continue to do what I truly believe are the right things to do. Uh, we were, we were uh, during the, and I hate to even go here, but I guess I can. Uh, you, maybe we cut this part on the filming. No, I'm kidding. But we were threatened a couple of times on some of these movements. And we decided, they said, they're going to come up and they're going to boycott. And, and we determined we're just going to go out there and serve ice cream and sit with them. And, and uh, we're not going to let a movement dictate. And better yet, God's in control. Bottom line. And so I truly believe if we stay true to that, that no matter how bad or how bleak things look, that he will sustain us and get us through. But um, that's a great question because it's changing rapidly. So I apologize. I don't have all three, but yeah, okay. That's great. Okay, question the last one. Right. Yeah, I think uh, identifying first and foremost what the issue is, and then and then own up and own it, and and that's what we learned right out of the block. We have a situation; it's not good. Let's own it, um, and then from that to take this, those particular steps to not listen to the, the, what I call the white noise around. Uh, if you read the paper or you watched the news, it was a totally different story than what we were going through. But you're not going to change that story. And so, uh, again, from a faith standpoint, um, we believed if we stayed true to that and we really tackled the issues uh, which we needed to do. Uh, Listeria was not supposed to be an ice cream. Uh, minus 18 degree product, it's pasteurized, it's put in a cold environment. But what we learned is in that room, even as simple as the way we were cleaning, there's a chance that it can come in. And so uh, to identify, first and foremost, take ownership and then identify the steps that you need to take and be humble, but yet at the same time work hard. And, and, and again, pray that the answers that you're giving um, are taking you to where you want to go. Uh, because, yeah, it got very, very dark. Um, it, uh, to a point when, you know, our company was a, uh, company that was, we had no debt of any kind. Uh, we were sitting in a place that was just, it was a great place to be. And then this thing popped up and it changed, changed us. So hopefully I got in the ballpark to answer, but, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. All right. How about another big hand for Ricky Dixon? Thank you so much.